here are 10 dark facts that you should know about Karl Marx. And now, although some may think that the Western world has learned this lesson about Marxism, in recent times, this dangerous ideology has again come to prominence in new forms. Marxist ideologies are seeping into many areas of culture, and many today are unwittingly taken captive by this vain human philosophy. See Colossians 2 8. Perhaps this is partly because many modern Western people today have forgotten the lessons of history. Thus, it would seem like we're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past as a sort of new, uh, evolved, globalist, you know, sort of Marxism has started to have powerful influence. Now, how are we to make sense of it and how are we to respond? Well, let me give you a little bit of insight. The Theotivity Podcast. Theotivity is the place where theology and creativity come together. Here you'll find audio narration of articles, episodes exploring the faith, culture, the arts and media, systematic theology, apologetics, guest interviews with Christian thinkers, creatives, pastors, theologians, and much more. At Theotivity.com, you'll find articles and resources to help you grow in your faith, as well as a portfolio of creative works. Like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date on the latest content. Hey, and welcome to the Theotivity Podcast. My name is Thaddeus, and I'm glad that you joined me for this important episode. Karl Marx was born on May 5th, 1818 in Trier, Germany. Marx is one of the most important figures in recent history and his ideological legacy continues to impact us today. He is most frequently known for his ep- economic uh, social theory, which gave rise to socialism and then communism. Marx's critical theories about societies, uh, economies and politics collectively should be understood as Marxism. Um, they hold that human societies develop through class conflict. Uh, and his most famous book, arguably, is the Con- Communist Manifesto, which he wrote with his co-author and friend Frederick Engels. Now, communism uh, is Marx's evil offspring. Um, and it has been a blight on our world everywhere it has been tried and implemented. Actually, in 1999, the Black Book of Communism from Harvard University Press tried to tally up the death toll of the Marxist-Leninist sort of communism in various countries. And the figure that they came up with was approaching 100 million people. Let me break that down for you. In the USSR, there's 20 million deaths. In China, 65 million deaths. In Vietnam, 1 million deaths. North Korea, 2 million deaths and counting. Cambodia, 2 million deaths as well. Eastern Europe, 1 million deaths. Latin America, 150,000 deaths. Africa, 1.7 million deaths. Afghanistan, 1.5 million deaths, right? The international communist movement and communist parties not in power Uh, account for about a a further 10,000 deaths. And even if these figures um, are presented here as conservative estimates, meaning that it could be much more, um, with many speculating that the numbers are actually a lot more higher. Um, For example, Alexander Yakovlev, um, who was a high-level Soviet official, who is one of Michael Gorbachev's uh, chief reformers, he attempted to estimate the victims of Joseph Stalin's regime alone, right? And the number that he came up with was actually between 60 to 70 million people. That's in the USSR alone. But that's in Canada. Former US President Ronald Reagan described a communist as one who reads Karl Marx and an anti-communist as one who understands Karl Marx. And Reagan described communism as neither an economic nor political system, but rather as a form of insanity, and I have to agree. Yet, there are still many world leaders and Ivy League educators, school teachers and professors and politicians and elite intelligentsia and cultural influencers who still adore Marx's system of thought and think that it is the road to utopia. It finds its way into entertainment, into movies and news media as well, so that its influence is actually pretty pervasive today. Indeed, some um, may have brought Um, bought into uh, some of its tenets actually unknowingly. Now, there's a lot of relevance for today. There are many movements today which find their basis actually in classical Marxism, such as, for example, critical race theory, popular topic these days. Um, Much of the leftist and socialist policies held by liberals and radical third wave wave, uh, feminists even, and post-colonial theory, Many in the LGBTQ agenda actually have embraced Marxist principles and tactics as well as queer theory and even fat and disability studies. These disciplines and agendas are what some may call cultural Marxism, where tenets and principles of classical Marxism are taken and applied to cultural and social issues today. 
usually um, adding in a healthy dose of um, you know, postmodernism as well. This is one of the most pervasive ideologies around in our day today. And it also helps to make sense of why so many of these leftist sort of causes tend to go together, with many seeing them as like a package deal. You ever wondered about that? Every generation of the church has its ideological battles to fight. And I believe that one of the major ones in our generation is Marxism's devil spawn that we're facing today. Um, thus, Christians and Christian leaders should actually do well to familiarize themselves with the threat and to know how to respond biblically with the truth and equip their people. So for our purposes here, we'll be taking a look at 10 disturbing facts about socialism and communism's founding father, Karl Marx. And this is not just to be a smear campaign uh, about Marx or some sort of ad hominem against him, but rather to point out that the roots of movements and ideologies, they matter. And we can learn a lot about a particular movement by looking at its genesis and founder, right? We can't separate Marxism from the mind behind Marxism and the man behind it, right? Men start revolutionary changes for reasons connected to their private lives. Aristotle said that. So first thing that you need to know, first dark fact about Marx is one, he was demonic. Okay, so I guess I'm going to come out of the gates swinging here, right? But many in Marx's own family and close friends seem to have real serious concerns about Karl Marx and even suspicions about the occult or demonic influences on his life. His father, Heinrich, uh, questioned actually if Karl was governed by a demon in a letter in 1837 that he wrote to him as my dear devil. Kind of weird for a father to, you know, call his son that. His closest friend, actually, Engels, referred to him as a monster of 10,000 devils, and his wife called him a wicked knave. Others of his associates compared him to Faust and Mistephiles, um, describing his demeanor and on occasion as possessed. Robert Payne, a prolific academic biographer of Marx and respected scholar, said, quote, that he had the devil's view of the world and the devil's malignity. Sometimes he um, seemed to, to know that he was accomplishing works of evil. Marx actually hails Satan as the eternal rebel, the first freethinker and emancipator of worlds. Now, some such as Wurmbrand make the case that Marx was a Satanist, while admirers of Marx may always make excuses for him. However, Marx also had a special preference for Mephistopheles, a demon featured in German folklore, and he was especially fond of Mephistopheles' uh, line from the Faust, which says, quote, everything that exists deserves to perish. This is no surprise, though. It actually reflects the very thinking of the man who, in letters, called for the, quote, ruthless criticism of all that exists, and who, in the manifesto that he wrote, declared that communism seeks to abolish the present state of things. This man was bent on destruction. I believe that Marxist ideology is one of the major weapons that Satan has employed in our day, and its demonic influence on societies is felt all over, is deceptive and poses uh, as an angel of light. Indeed, as we look at some of the devastations that both classical and today's cultural Marxism has wrecked, um, one can't actually help but see it as demonic, if you really truly see it for what it is. Marxism brings as much and more suffering and division as did Marx in his own life. Marx ruined his own and the lives of those around him, and now his ideology continues to ruin lives to date. Second dark fact that you need to know is that Marx was actually a religious leader. Marx was not simply envisioning another neutral economic theory as some people might think. Marxism is actually an alternative worldview with religious proportions. Um, for Marx and Engels, when they drafted the Communist Manifesto, they saw it as a revolutionary, quote, catechism, as the Communist Confession of Faith. And this is proven in Engels' uh, letter to Marx, actually, in 1847, where he said, quote, I believe we had better drop the catechism form and call the thing Communist Manifesto, right? He was fearing that giving away the religious nature of the idea would actually turn people away. Marx's ideology was materialist to the core. It focused on money, prosperity, property, and gold. And thus, the, the key to the communist utopia was actually economics. This is why Marx wrote that way. He adamantly rejected any notion of a god, actually. Economics was Marx's salvation. 
Uh, for the communist, man does uh, actually does live by bread alone, contrary to what Jesus says. And it's ironic that socialists and communists will blast their wealthy for being obsessed with money when actually they're really just projecting their own obsession, envy, and coveting, and greed. And we see many examples of such hypocrisy from political pundits and leaders of the left. It seems like the radical left has openly embraced much of the cultural Marxism of our day. Now, Marxism is not religiously neutral. It's a system that is hostile, especially to Christianity. And Christians need to be alert to this danger today. We have to see Marxism and all the ideologies which derive from it, such as critical theory, as applied to the variety of fields um, such as you know, racism and LGBTQ stuff and queer studies and post-colonialism, etc. Uh, we have to view all of those as not just academic ideas, but as actually competing worldviews. And this is why its adherents often have a sort of religious fervor and devotion around their cause. It is their faith and salvation, you see. Um, they are a systems of thought which, which seek to make sense of all of reality and provide comprehensive solutions. They are another religion altogether and cannot be mixed with Christianity. Yet this is exactly what some Christians and church leaders are seeking to do today. One cannot take on these ideologies as an analytical tool without having to take on the fundamental presuppositions of those systems. Third dark fact you need to know about Karl Marx is that he was militantly athe atheistic, and so is his ideology. Now, even though Marx and Engels envisioned themselves as religious leaders right, um, of their new faith to the world, they were at the same time atheists. However, Karl Marx did not just deny God's existence or was you know, dispassionately agnostic about it. He actually hated God. The reason for his hatred um, are, are actually quite many, including his distesting of absolute truth and having any objective moral standards to be held accountable. Communism begins, Marx said, where atheism begins. In the Communist Manifesto, he and Engels remarked, quote, communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality. Marx saw religion as a crutch and the way that people invent, um, you know, invented something to help themselves deal with suffering. He actually famously wrote, quote, religious suffering is at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of a soulless con condition. It is the opium of the people. Now, Paul Kinger, he, wrote, he knows this, that the, the Soviet leadership would want Marxism and the state to be central to all citizens' lives. Hence, the words of the Communist Manifesto were meant to be read and learned drilled and memorized and internalized. Any challenging text, especially an influential one like the Bible, was actually unwelcomed. And this is why you still see this today in communist countries like North Korea, for example. Um, religion was perceived as an ever-present powerful enemy, not to be taken lightly. That's from Paul Kenger's book, The Devil and Karl Marx. Now, Marx was um, most passionately against Christianity of all religions. He seemed um, actually favorable to Muslims, very interesting, and praised certain Muslims, expressing sympathy for their hatred against Christians and the hope of an ultimate victory over those infidels. Um, this is something that the present-day leftist politicians actually seem to have in common with Marx, who always seem to support Islam above other religions, especially Christianity. I find that quite interesting. Now, throughout history, one of the most brutally restricted rights by communist governments was and remains the freedom of worship, which communists always and everywhere have attacked with fervor. Now, one may wonder why an atheistic ideology would be so threatened by religion. Uh, this is because belief in God stands in the way of totalitarian desire to transform human nature. God becomes actually a competitor to the communist control of the body, mind, and spirit of man that Marx wanted to redefine in his own image. And this is why totalitarian states are usually hostile to religion, and especially Christianity, since the sovereign God of the Bible threatens to se the secular state's claim to total sovereignty. Now, whether the totalitarian leader was uh, Fidel Castro or Paul Pot or jo Joseph Stalin, the, the sentiment was always the same. Wherever they went, um, from 
east to west, from Africa to Asia, from North Korea to the Soviet Union, communists, they shared one goal, the annihilation of religion, right? Quote, Marx was not first a communist and then an atheist. He was first an atheist, then a communist. Communism was merely the political expression of his atheism. As he hated God, so he would hate those who own property. That was from Schult, uh, Fulton Sheen's The Church, Communism, and Democracy. Now, while Marxism has not um, succeeded in convincing the world that there is no God, it has succeeded in convincing the world that there is a devil. Uh, we must recognize that at the core of these ideologies is a desire to destroy the true religion and supplant their own false one. Fourth, dark fact that you should know about Karl Marx is his covetousness and theft. Marx himself stated that, quote, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. And where does um, all that property go to, you might ask? Well, the sovereign state, of course. However, God's commandments in the Bible says that thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet. And both of those commands imply and require actually the ownership of private property. Theft implies that you're taking something that actually belongs to another. Similarly, coveting implies that you're um, desiring that which belongs to another. And Marx's system actually envisions the abolition of private ownership of any goods having everything subsumed into the all-powerful state to distribute. Just let me stop there. That on this ground, every Christian should um, agree that that is just theft and covetousness played out, right? Theft is theft, even if governments commit it. And to assume that the government can just take anything is actually to assume that the government owns everything. And it's interesting that in Marx's own life, he was constantly... Um, jobless and struggling to provide for his own family because of his aversion to working. Right? He envisioned what others had and his system enshrined this vice right, as one of the core of its principles. He envied what other people had. And thus, Marxism actually leads to despotism. Right? He admitted so himself. He said, quote, of course, in the beginning, this cannot be effected except by means of despotic inroads. Right? And he was speaking there of the seizure of private property by the communist state. All Marxist ideologies end up systematizing covetousness and entitlement. Both qualities are passed on from their originator. Everywhere socialism and communism has been tried is actually led to economic devastation and to not to prosperity. That's true every single instant. And this is what a system built on covetousness produces. The socialist or communistic countries, which have managed to avoid this fate, actually do so by modifying or rejecting Marx's economic theory in favor of a more free market or hybrid style sort of economy. And we should not covet and think that um, we're entitled to what our neighbor has and then employ the state's coercive, coercive powers to steal from them through taxation or seizure to then redistribute through some sort of bureaucratic welfare system. This goal of the abolition of private property is concerning today, especially in light of the World Economic Forum's vision for the future, where we'll apparently own nothing and be happy. And it's actually a part of their eight predictions for the world by 2030. They envision a future where we will not actually own anything, but rather rent what we need from the state. And I guess when the state doesn't like what you think or do, you know, it could just Cancel your rental abilities for food, transport, education, housing, etc. Right? You name it. Many global leaders today are actually working hard to make this future a reality, and we do well to pay attention. The fifth dark fact that you should know about Karl Marx is that he was a violent revolutionary. At the end of his Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx writes this quote: "The communists openly declare." that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. So it's no surprise then that you know, his followers have also often turned to violent revolutionary means. Marx actually wrote this quote, There is only one way in which the murderous death, agonies of the old society 
and the bloody birth throes of the new society can be shortened, simplified, and concentrated. And that way is revolutionary terror. That quote should send some shivers down your spine. The violence associated with Marxist ideologies and causes is actually not accidental. It's part of the system. Robert Payne records that Marx stated emphatically that, quote, socialism cannot be brought into existence without revolution. He said that there must be a literal process of, quote, overthrowing the old filthy yoke and founding a new society only in a revolution. That's from Payne, uh, Payne's work uh, on Marx, his biography. Now, this tendency towards violent revolution continues to be a marker of today's Marxist causes. Um, there is a reason why the Black Lives Matter symbol, for example, resembles closely the raised communist fist. The two are connected ideologies, and the mostly peaceful burning of cities, of social justice riots, are simply the outworking of that system. Actually, BLM's founders themselves actually openly admit to being trained Marxists. The sixth dark fact that you need to know about Karl Marx is that he was a dark poet. Marx himself actually wrote in a poem in 1937, quote, Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. Marx's poetry is actually quite disturbing and reveals some of the darkness inside of his troubled soul. Paul Johnson actually comments on uh, Marx's poetry. He says, quote, Savagery is the characteristic note of his verse. Together with the intense pessimism of the human condition, hatred, a fascination with corruption and violence, suicide pacts, and pacts with the devil. That's from Paul Johnson's uh, work, Intellectuals. Now, in one of his poems, which was evidently addressed to his love, Jenny, he writes of a sort of um, suicide pact. He says, quote, Darling, thou hast drunk of poison, and now thou must depart with me. Now the night has fallen, there is no longer any day. Now, he pressed her violently to his heart, death on her breath and breast. She was pierced by deeper pain, and her eyes were closed forever. It's interesting that such despair and suicide through drinking poison shows up in his poetry, since two of Karl Marx's daughters actually killed themselves by drinking poison in a suicide pact. Now, this sad story is illustrative, I think, of the continued darkness that attends the Marxist causes. And indeed, much of the cultural Marxism of our day advances a culture of death in their attitudes and beliefs towards abortion, sexual reproduction, and euthanasia. The seventh dark fact that you need to know about Karl Marx is that he had a messed up family. Kind of alluded to this already, but Marx was a parasite on his parents. He leached off of them for pretty much his entire life. He refused to work constantly for wages, and instead he mooched off of his parents and friends as much as possible. Uh, eventually, his parents financially actually cut him off because he was draining their life savings, enraging Marx in the process as they cut him off. And his suffering mother actually expressed the wish that, quote, Karl would accumulate capital instead of just writing about it. And his suffering wife actually would say the same. She said, quote, Karl, if you had only spent more time making capital instead of writing about it, we would have been better off. Naturally, his family suffered the most from Marx's attitude to work, being destitute from his laziness. His wife and kids lacked money, food, and steady roof over their heads, and even medical attention. Now, Paul Johnson actually states that as Marx's daughters grew, he denied them a satisfactory education, if any education at all, and vetoed careers for them entirely. Finally, when his elderly mom died, he got a lawyer to actually make sure that he got a large share of the inheritance. Quite a guy. Indeed, what um, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5.8 actually holds true for Karl Marx. He says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, Marx, being an unbeliever, was perhaps the worst of the worst specimens. Now, furthermore, Marx stated candidly that he preferred male offspring. Marx actually lamented his wife Jenny's birthing abilities, writing, quote, My wife, alas, delivered a girl and not a boy. And as for the baby girl delivered by his um, daughter, he actually said, quote, I congratulate, congratulate you on the happy delivery. I prefer the male sex among children who will be born at this turning point in history. 
It is ironic that many modern, actually feminists, have taken to Marx's work. One of Marx's daughters actually lost all three of her young children while devoting herself to, quote, further her father's agenda. Another daughter actually gave up a cherished life as a journalist for a miserable marriage to one of her father's young French followers. And the third daughter became ensnared by a man whom she believed to be worthy of her father, but who, in the end, actually drove her to suicide. In fact, four of Marx's six children died before he did, including his oldest daughter, Jenny. Who, um, and the two daughters who survived him, um, one later committed suicide, and one of them, Laura, in a suicide pact with her husband and the son-in-law, um, whom Marx actually would ridicule relentlessly. His daughter, Eleanor, actually became a mistress to, um, who was uh, treated terribly by her lover and then husband, Aveling. Eleanor uh, had tried to actually kill herself at least once before with an opium overdose that failed. Now, later, Aveling, would convince her of a joint suicide to die together in each other's arm. Eleanor killed herself on March 31st, 1898, using a combination of chloroform and Prusik acid, who, as suggested by Aveling, who actually didn't keep his end of the promise to Eleanor. Eleanor. Um, with Eleanor dead, Aveling actually retreated to his 22-year-old girlfriend and inherited all of Eleanor's possessions that had been bequeathed to her by her father, including his books, royalties, and a massive collection of papers and documents. Now, another of his daughters, Laura, and her husband, Paul, entered into their own death pact. The couple killed themselves on November 25th or 26th, the history is kind of unclear, in 1911. Uh, Paul administered an injection of potassium cyanide into Laura that night and in injected himself in the morning. His, his, his suicide note said, quote, healthy in mind and spirit, I kill myself before pitiless old age. For many years, I promised myself not to live past 70 years. It's no wonder that in Marx's Communist Manifesto, one of his stated goals was actually, quote, the abolition of the family. And, you know, he actually eventually achieved this in his own family. Marx envisioned a collective rearing of children by the communist nanny state that would bring real freedom to all members of the family. Parenting would become the responsibility of the state. Uh, what perfect status vision, right, for a man who eschewed fatherhood and the idea of marital fidelity and commitment. Um, this is also one of the reasons why, Mar why Marxist causes, such as BLM, right, and their official platform before they removed it from their website, uh, actually tend towards the goal of the destruction of the family unit as designed by God. The eighth. Dark fact that you should know about Karl Marx is that he was lazy and had a lot of money problems. We touched on this a little bit, but let me explain a little bit more. Marx's laziness is actually obvious, but his hypocrisy is especially outrageous. Point three of his and Engels' 10-point plan in the manifesto called for, quote, abolition of all right of inheritance. Like so many communist leaders following him, Marx's, Marx and Engels uh, essentially said, rules for thee, but not for me. Uh, other people in the world did not deserve inheritances, but Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, they definitely did, right? Uh, Marx's manifesto didn't even help his own financial cause. It didn't even earn him a meager sum in the year after it was published. That winter, the Marx family actually sought refuge in a dilapidated boarding house, living like vagabonds. There, that bitterly cold season, the family baby, Heinrich Guido, uh, shortly after his first birthday, actually died of a cold, a victim of his communist father's irresponsibility. At the start of their marriage in 1843, Marx had um, a well-paying job writing for a journal. However, by 1852, Jenny wrote a letter in June pleading with her husband, saying, quote, I had firmly decided not to torment you constantly with money problems, and now here I am again. But truly, Carl, I no longer have any good course. She explained that the landlady was literally beating at the door. Jenny wrote, quote, She has really put me in a state of terror. She has already had our belongings auctioned off. And in addition, baker, governess, tea grocer, grocer, and the terrible man, the butcher. I am in a state, Carl. I no longer know what to do. For all these people, I am exposed as a liar. Paul Kenger notes that, quote, Karl Marx had placed his wife in a state of terror over money and property just as his writings and ideology would do to countless millions in the centuries ahead. 
The landlord was actually also fed up with Marx's lack of grooming and hygiene. Uh, he was an alcoholic and a chain smoker who actually never exercised and suffered from warts and boils and the lack of, um, from his lack of washing and bathing, right? Uh, he stunk. Uh, quote, washing, grooming, and changing his linens are things he does rarely and he likes to get drunk, stated a Prussian police spy report on Marx. Uh, quote, he has no fixed times for going to sleep or waking up. Uh, as for the family apartment, everything is broken down, busted, spilled, smashed, falling apart from toys and chairs and dishes and cups to tables and tobacco pipes and on and on. Um, in a word, said the report, everything is topsy-turvy. To sit down becomes a thoroughly dangerous business. Now, the ideologies and causes that have sprung up from Marx's ideas also share his aversion to honest labor and often lead to ep economic devastation. Every single failed socialist state has landed its people into abject poverty and encouraged a massively entitled group of entitled welfare abusers to fund their laziness off of the hard work of others. And the more that the welfare state grows, the less productive the population will become. Needing to earn money to feed oneself is actually a great practical motivator towards honest work. Who would have known, right? Ninth fact, dark fact, that you need to know about Karl Marx is that he was actually a racist. Now, because Paul, his daughter's husband, was Cuban, Marx viewed him as marred by Negro blood in his vein, prompting Marx to uh, denigrate him as Negrillo, and that the, uh, he used to call him the gorilla. Now, Karl Marx was a racist who cast racial slurs and hatred against blacks and Jews. Ironics, given that Marx was actually ethnically a Jew. Even his admiring biographer, Francis Wien, uh, who habitually defends even the worst in Marx, actually admits that, quote, he sprayed anti-Semitic insults at his enemies with savage glee. In a July 1862 letter to Engels, the, in, in reference to his uh, socialist political com competitor, uh, Ferdinand Lassalle, um, whom he called a Jewish N-word, uh, Marx wrote, quote, it is now completely clear to me that he, uh, as is proven by his cranial formation and his hair, descends from the Negroes from Egypt, assuming that his mother or grandmother had not been inbred with a N-word. Uh, now this union of Judaism and Germanism with a basic Negro substance must produce a peculiar product. The obtrusiveness of the fellow is also N-word-like. That's some really classy stuff by Marx. <laughs> Marx is also recorded as writing to Engels in 1866 that the common Negro type is the uh, degenerate form of a much higher one, a very significant advance over Darwin. Now, it's quite ironic then that the Black Lives Matter movement co-founder pa Patrice Coolers actually unashamedly calls herself a trained Marxist. Elsewhere, Marx wrote of Jews saying, quote, thus we find it find every tyrant backed by a Jew, as is every pope by a Jesuit. In truth, the cravings of oppressors would be hopeless and the practicability of war out of the question if there were not an army of Jesuits to smother thought and a handful of Jews to ransack pockets. The fact that 1,855 years ago Christ drove the Jewish money changers out of the temple and that the money changers of our age enlisted on the side of tyranny happen again to be Jews is perhaps no more than historic coincidence. That was from Karl Marx's book, The Russian Loan, in 1856. Now, Marx's anti-Semitic views were no secret. In 1844, he published an essay titled On the Jewish Question. He wrote that the worldly religion of the Jews was huckstering and that the Jews' god was money. Marx's view of the Jews was that they could only become an emancipated ethnicity or culture when they no longer exist. Just one step short of calling for genocide, Marx said, quote, the classes and the races too weak to master the new conditions of life must give way. Now, Hitler actually drew on Marx's demonic philosophy. Hitler said in an interview in 1934 that, quote, national socialism derives from each of the two camps the pure idea that characterizes it, national resolution from bourgeois tradition, 
vital creative socialism from the teaching of Marxism. An essential component of, the, of many of the cultural Marxist causes today is some form of partiality and discrimination. It can be you know, unfair discrimination against Caucasians, privileging, privileging of minority groups, or the perpetual assumed innocence of perceived oppressed groups. And this is another feature um, that is at the core of these ideologies today. Christians should know better as God's law actually teaches us to show no partiality, regardless of any external distinguishing markers, uh, because we're all one in Adam, sharing a common humanity, and for Christians, we are all one in Christ, sharing a common redeemer. Tenth, dark fact that you should know about Karl Marx is that he was unfaithful. Karl eventually um, bedded Helen de Muth, their housekeeper, behind Jenny's back. Uh, historians have no idea how often or the exact circumstances, including whether or not it was consensual. Uh, quote, he, he would take his comfort where he could, wrote one biographer of Marx seeking um, a sexual receptacle in De Muth. Quote, that she was virtually his bond slave was a matter of entire indifference to him. It was enough that she was available to serve his sexual needs at a time when Jenny was too ill to satisfy them. We shall probably never know whether he raped or seduced the servant. Though the large number of images concerned uh, with rape in his later writings suggest that it was rape rather than seduction, in due course, a child was born." End quote. Engels actually ended up taking the fall for his friend Marx, claiming that the child was actually his. However, decades later on his deathbed, Engels actually admitted that the child was Karl's and that Engels had intervened to help his friend cover up the truth and to try to save Marx's marriage. Marxist ideologies also tend uh, um, to actually be unfaithful, just like their founder. Unfaithful to truth, unfaithful to the grand promises its leaders make to their followers, and unfaithful to produce any sort of godly offspring. So this is Karl Marx. This is the man who is behind Marxism, the ideology that drives socialism, communism, and many of the critical social justice and leftist causes that exist today. Now, one might ask, how is it that anyone would follow this man's ideas? Why is it that the economic theories of a man who could not even keep his own house in order and provide for his own people were given so much weight? It boggles reason, right? Yet his ideology has been taught in schools and in universities and even crept into many churches and denominations today. We would do well as Christians to pause and to critically analyze these movements from a Christian and biblical worldview and exercise caution and discernment for their message. Ultimately, though, while it is good to be aware of these things, it is actually familiarity with the truth, with God's word, that will guard his people against error. We must commit ourselves to understand how all of God's word applies to all of life, because the areas that we overlook or weaken will be actually, and actually have proven to be, the areas where we are most susceptible and are in danger, right? Because people turn to false ideologies like Marxism because they've not been convicted of the true way to flourish that God's word actually shows us. And thus the task of the cultural apologetics and public theology for today is actually vital to the modern church um, in order to reclaim our culture. Now, I think that by God's word and spirit, I believe that we can and will do this. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the Theotivity Podcast. If you did, make sure to give a like and share of this episode as that helps with just furthering our reach. Until next time, solely do glory. Thanks for listening to the Theotivity Podcast. If you found this content helpful or edifying, please leave a review on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, follow us on social media and consider sharing this episode to help Theotivity reach others as well. Check out Theotivity.com for resources, info on how to support, and subscribe to our monthly newsletter to stay up to date on all the latest content. Until next time, live and create to the glory of God.